even outside that. Give me one example where a citizen used an assault rifle with a high-capacity magazine for a constructive purpose. Now, they always present this theoretic, well, what if there's not one or two invaders to my home? What if there's 10 or 12? And after I've killed the first eight or nine, I need to reload. Yeah, let me know when that happens. Mm -hmm. and A 15-year-old at home with his 12-year-old sister when burglars try to break in. That's when investigators say the boy grabbed his dad's assault rifle and started shooting. And he hit one of the men repeatedly. This all unfolded this afternoon in the 2600 block of Royal Place Court. A young boy was protecting his sister. You know, he was in fear for his life and, and for his sister's life. The brother grabbed his father's assault rifle and knew what to do with it. His dad is a Precinct 1 deputy constable. We don't try to hide things from our children in law enforcement. The children were not hurt. The home invaders fled, leaving a trail of blood. Two suspects showed up at Tombow Hospital. One, the adult, had multiple gunshot wounds and was flown to Memorial Hermann Hospital. The second, a juvenile, was taken back here. Here's the armed couple. They both have handguns. They are greeted at the door by the receptionist. The business owner is sitting in a chair against the wall. The bad guy points his gun at the receptionist's head. The security guard is in the office pulling out an AR-15 rifle. After the shootout, the security guard lunges to the door. This is video from a surveillance system overlooking the driveway of the victim's home. You can see the suspects pull up in their car. One of the would-be home invaders fires a shot as he runs into the garage. Within seconds, several more shots ring out. Investigators say these came from the man inside the house. Look closely. Shards of glass fly as bullets hit the front windshield. This is one of the two cameras that caught this crime on tape. Once the homeowner started shooting back, the suspects scattered. Three ran that way. The final one jumped back into the car and sped away. You can see in the driveway some of the black rubber still left behind. Window. Voice says the two armed men broke through the basement window. They must have just fake tap to lure me downstairs like it was a knock on the door. He came downstairs and saw a gun trained on him. Just seeing two people unannounced in my house. That was the shock factor. I heard one scream from him, and I knew it wasn't like a, it wasn't like a, I stepped on a piece of glass kind of scream. It was like some, something primal, I guess. His roommate, Raymond, who asked us to omit his last name, began unlocking his rifle. You know, being a good gun owner, everything was locked. He had little time as one of the armed men approached his door. By the time I had, had it out and ready, uh, one, of the, one of the men came at my door, slowly opened it, saw that there was a barrel on the other side, and from there, backed out. At that point, the gun was unloaded. No shots were fired, and the intruders left. It was just afterwards where it just all hit me, and it was like... You know, I could have died. I could have killed somebody. It's like it all, it all set in. His legally owned rifle is an AR-15 used for sport. That was until Tuesday when it was needed for more. Without that gun that day, things could have went differently. I'm happy you saved my life. That's it. Carrie Shannon in tears as she watches the video her security system recorded. They had them put their gloves on now. She was home alone as four young men tried to kick in her door at 4.35 Sunday morning. I immediately jumped up. She got out of bed, called police with her cell phone with one hand, and in the other... I grabbed my handgun and I proceeded right to the back. Because as soon as I saw a shadow, I was going, I was going to go ahead and start shooting. After several kicks, the men gave up and took off. I just want to be safe here in my own home. That's all I want. Signs of the attempted home invasion are everywhere. The fence door's lock is broken, and the cameras didn't miss it. It even caught one of the men cutting the phone line. Shannon gave the video to the cops, and she hopes it leads to justice. I hope you go to jail, because you need to leave people alone. Shannon believes this incident may be connected to another burglary that happened almost three weeks ago. In that case, four men stormed into her house through the front door. She is tired of living in fear.
It's just a hard-working woman trying to live, trying to support her son, trying to support herself. I'm just trying to live a better life. But don't let the tears fool you. She has already invested in more protection. I'm not scared to use it. Just in case they come back. So when they hit that door, this is what I'm going to hit them with. The ultimate looter's defense. We are on Olympic Boulevard in Koreatown at the Olympic Discount Store. There are 28 men, armed men, everyone with guns, on duty 24 hours a day, they tell me, protecting this store. That looks to be an Uzi that that, that uh, man is. Uh... Well, it looks on the roof, it, it looks to us uh, that the man on the roof has, has some kind of automatic weapon, but. Judd McElvain sitting next to me here, and he's far more uh, familiar with weaponry than I am. He says it looks to be a 9mm Uzi. This has to be a disturbing sight to LAPD and uh, to the National Guard uh, officers out there as well. The, the troops uh, have to be very concerned about this scene. Absolutely. Although both subjects had previously received multiple hits, they were not incapacitated until struck in the head of these last rounds. In the span of less than five minutes, over 140 rounds had been fired. Two special agents and both subjects lay dead, and five of the surviving six agents were wounded. Would anyone care to discuss the experiences they had trying to reload during this gunfight? John Hanwell, I think he, uh, he best described it, uh, and I felt the same way after uh, he uh, gave the analogy of uh, after you fire your first six rounds like I did and uh, fired the five rounds that he had in his chief, uh, that after you recognized, uh, you realized that you were out of ammunition, you heard the uh, gun firing continued, continuing in a rapid way from the subject's vehicle. Uh, it was kind of like uh, in him and me, uh, just letting the air, uh, the adrenaline, uh, just uh, basically uh, flowed out of uh, both of us. And I think John best described that uh, if there was any time during this incident um, uh, that I was uh, fearful, it was right at that particular time. Uh, I knew after I was out of ammo, I had to seek cover, but it was a very empty feeling. Uh, and I know Hanlon felt the same way, suddenly being out of ammunition. And then in my particular case, and I know in John's particular case, we both had our uh, right hands blown up, our shooting hands. Uh, John was uh, shot again uh, while trying to reload his weapon. Uh, I ended up back behind my vehicle, of course, and I was trying to uh, reload my weapon uh, with one hand. Uh, I was making the conscious decision in my own mind as I was coming around in the car after I had fired my six, uh, how many rounds am I going to try and get into my weapon? One, two, three, four. How much time do I have? Is he going to come around the front of the car and uh, take a couple more pops at me? Uh, I believe I got four into my hand. I finally decided I got two into my revolver, uh, tried to close it. Uh, something as elementary and as simplistic as uh, if you only can get two live rounds in, uh, which way is the cylinder going to turn? Uh, you certainly don't want to hit on four empties if you only get two in there. Um, we talked about reloading a little bit. There was, I think, something you wanted to get off your chest about uh, about loading. Want to talk about that? Well, it was just something that was uh, somebody mentioned to me that uh, they had heard that I had to reload a, uh, a magazine, uh, which was uh, which was wrong. I fired uh, the first magazine. I had an ankle holster on. My first uh, instinct, as having emptied a, a magazine to grab for the nearest thing that had bullets in it, and that's the gun on my uh, ankle, which I did. Uh, I fired one shot with uh, that weapon, it's a Model 60, and having shot uh, rounds with the, uh, the 459, it just didn't seem like it was going to do the job, so that's when I put another magazine in the, uh, uh, the 459 and continued firing. How much ammunition would you fellas recommend that an agent carry? in this particular situation as much as you can carry. Uh, I know a lot of agents uh, that uh, use revolvers go out uh, with a revolver, no pouch, no spare ammo, and if they're involved in a confrontation, they've got five or six and that's all. We got to talking about the, the position uh, Jerry Dove was in. Uh, Try to put yourself in a position where you fired over 20 some odd rounds. You know you've hit the guy. Uh, your gun's probably been hit, but you have no more ammunition. 
uh, we had two magazines uh, at Right Ronda. We, we found the one in the front seat of the car, and then the one that was in the gun uh, was empty. And the slide was back, and he had fired all of the rest of his ammo. He had had nothing left. Gil Laurentia had uh, six and six. He had six in his revolver, six in a pouch, and was reaching for the uh, ammo box in the glove compartment. Uh, the ammo box in the glove compartment is great, but if you're if you're caught in an alley or in a stairwell or a warehouse in a gunfight, you know, that ammo box in the car isn't going to do you much good. So my recommendation to people uh, who are serious about uh, street survival, as Ron said, is to carry as much as you, uh, as you can possibly carry. I think the will to survive basically just says it all. As I was reminiscing about the incident, I was reminded of a part of a poem by Dylan Thomas. It's a poem about dying, and it goes, do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. That poem had some impact on me as a young man, and I guess that you could say that I was raging against the dying of the light on April 11th. What I'm trying to say is that you have to be mentally prepared for a possible violent confrontation. And if you are shot or injured, it does not necessarily mean that you will die. I was wounded twice, and I knew that my injury, the injury to my left arm, was serious, but it was not immediately life-threatening. So I just basically ignored it. Gordon McNeil received two wounds, one wound to the chest, a K-5 hit, and he is still alive. Maddox was shot six times before he died. Platt was shot 12 times before he died. John Hanlon was wounded three or four times, and he is still alive today. So the point here is that just because you are injured does not mean that you are going to die. You should also remember that if you shoot or injure your subject, does not mean that he is going to die either, even if you shoot him one or two times. So it works both ways. I can say with some authority that if you give up, if you lay down to die, then that is exactly what will happen. You will die. If you give up the will to live, then I don't know how to describe it. Your spirit, whatever, will dissipate will disappear. That's, that's number one. Number two, if you lay down to die, then most probably the subject that got you in the first place is going to come around the corner, come around the car, or whatever, and he is going to shoot you point blank, and you will die. So if you lay down to die, the message is you will die. You have got to maintain the will to live.